with Larry, uh, I don't know, Larry and I kind of developed a relationship. I don't know quite where it all started, but. Well, we had, we, we do a lot of shows together. Yeah. And there are times during those shows, usually the last day, where everybody's sitting around, there are very few people, so you're talking to each other. We, we found that we had some commonality. Right. Our age is similar. Yeah, he's older than I am. <laughs> our, faith, <laughs> our faith is similar. Yeah. I actually am, I'm, an, I'm a year older. Yeah. Our faith, we got that in common. Uh, we got to talking about microbes and we've got that in common, so. Uh, and, and, and Larry has been a, a, a lifelong uh, vet and had a lot of experience with the livestock industry and, and really understands the crop side too. So we've integrated our, our uh, what he does with the bio rig, with what we're doing and we're kind of helping each other and scratching each other's back and it's a good mm -hmm. relationship. And, and, uh, but Larry, maybe before you get into that, just, just shortly or briefly, uh, explain to people what happened to you personally in regard to, to the Monerd deal and then we can go ahead into, uh, into the program. Well, over the years I've managed sow operations. Uh, sometimes at the same time that I was working as a consultant, I was actually moved, I moved to Hayward in Iowa to manage a, an 800, well, it, it was intended to have been an, almost a 2,000 sow uh, operation, a niche market operation where you use the bedding and all of that. Um, as it turned out, it wasn't ready for me, so they put me in charge of a, of a similar operation that was a little bit smaller. I managed to damage my shoulder. That took me out of that. Um, so after my shoulder was repaired and I'm out of actual management, I had a little more time. So I was helping my nephews with their sow operation and my son and I, uh, my son was in between jobs, so we were helping them. They actually had a, a pit line from the farrowing house that was plugged. So I'd done this before. In fact, I did a lot of that with the sow operation I managed because we were using bedding and we had pit lines. And we were forever using a, a a power washer with a with a spinner on it to empty those lines. So okay, I I'm going to help my nephews out. And so it was the end of the day. We had actually uh, I also was managing their their small sow operation that particular day, and I was going to actually go the next that day I think to Wilbur had an open house. Uh, I was going to go there after I got finished. So my son and I, this should be an easy thing to do. I'll unplug this line. Well, what they had from the farrowing house, they had what they call a day pit. So it's, it's a, an eight foot deep pit. It's eight foot uh, back into, it, it allows the, each, the lines from all the different buildings to come into a, one site and then from there it goes to a lagoon. So you have an opportunity, if the line is plugged, you can get that line unplugged, goes to that, and then out to the lagoon. Well, we got the line unplugged. I was the one down in the pit. I got it unplugged. As Soon as the manure started moving, I got out, of course. And so my son went to shut the power washer off. Well, in order to do that, he had to go through all the buildings, and I told him I'd meet him, it was the end of the day, I'd meet him, we'd go for a cup of coffee and then I was gonna go on to Wilbur and my son was gonna go a different direction. He happens to be a smoker, so he took a, he was waiting for me, he took a smoke break and I didn't come. So he goes back to the site and I had the pit 
uh, the uh, power washer hose out, just like I had said I would, only I wasn't there. So he thought, well, maybe I was around the other side of the building or something. He just happened to glance down and I was in the pit. And he thought I had fallen in. Well, I had probably, I don't know because everything, I was out. But he found me on my back, my legs kind of in an odd way. He thought maybe I'd broken a leg too. So the manure was gone, the, that pit was empty, but I was down there. So he went down and checked me out and propped me up. Well, he didn't have his phone on him, so he had to go back all the way through the building, call my nephews. They didn't even remember what the 911 location was. So they had to in turn find that out, call the prior owner of, the, anyway, this all took time. In the meantime, I'm down in that pit. My son finally got this, you know, passed it off to my nephews and, and this is all taking time too. He came down in the pit just to keep telling me my wife is a nurse and my daughter is a nurse practitioner and they have been told, and this is pretty common knowledge, that even if a person is out, a lot of times they'll respond. So he, he kept talking to me saying, keep breathing, dad, keep breathing, dad. And he had me propped up so I could breathe. And I don't know at what point in time, but at some point in time, I'm down in this pit and I have a bright light and I hear my son saying, keep breathing, dad. And uh, I think maybe it was at the time when the, when the emergency people got there because the whistles and whatever, that maybe was just enough to, to get me to wake up. Anyway, they were trying to decide how are they going to get me out of that pit because the manhole, you know, just barely enough room for somebody to get in. And what they, uh, what, what my son said, well, why don't I just lift him up? And he, he told me, and I guess I responded, put my arms up. They pulled me up and out. And I was in and out for quite, I don't know. I, I can remember them asking me questions and then I would kind of fade again, in and out. I've been told that the hydrogen sulfide results in lactic acid buildup in your body because uh, it interferes with oxygenation. And so lactic acid is the same thing that happens when you have a cramp or when, a, when an animal, when a horse ties up, they have a lactic acid buildup, but it's just in you know, one site. Typically, with that kind of a situation or if an athlete has a, has a tie up, their lactic acid uh, level they consider that high to be 0.5%. My blood lactic acid level was 5%. And my daughter was in communication with the head nurse that was in charge of me, and they, they ran IVs in both arms to flush this out as fast as they could. And uh, by flushing it out as fast as, as they could, it upset me, my physically, and they were trying to get my, my manure coveralls off me, and so they tipped me to the side, and I don't throw up very often, but I upchucked, and I can remember apologizing to the nurse that I upchucked, but I'm here to say it, you know, I, I made it. The other thing about hydrogen sulfide is it's, it's a very strong irritant. I didn't think about that, but it affects your eyes. So the next morning, I'm going to head for Wilbur. I'm bound determined to, to get to his uh, open house. And my eyes, you know, keep bothering me. I thought it's the sun, you know, uh, whatever. And uh, yeah, that hydrogen sulfide almost blinded me too. So Larry, I think 
so what you were out of the hole but you were leaning over the hole well we don't think, know or? we don't know but what i'm thinking maybe i was concerned whether that whether that line whether that manure would keep moving so it comes into this day pit and then it has to escape in another line well it's swirling and what do they do when they've you know, they, they spin that manure, that's what creates the hydrogen sulfide. It, it, it causes that hydrogen sulfide to come off. I have a hunch, I just checked to see if, you know, I probably just had my head over the, and then dropped in. It, it, it hits you that, that hard, that fast. So, and I, you know, we, we worked with two of us because you don't do that by yourself. No. You know, and that's common knowledge, so. I'm, I'm always telling people when they, when they empty their pits, be careful and all if that. If your son hadn't been there, you probably oh, yeah, wouldn't I, be here today. Yeah, I wouldn't be here. No. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah it's, okay. it's pretty spooky. Um, yeah, we, we've developed this uh, commonality. Um, a little background. Jim was telling you that you know, he got frustrated with with all the ag business type uh, things. Kind of the same thing in my case. Um, I graduated from Iowa State with a veterinary degree in 1971 and uh, started out working on my own, which is pretty unusual. Uh, 24-7 doesn't work very good for family. And so I went to work with a group in Orange City. And that was back in the days, I call them the fire engine days. We used to, the, the veterinarian that I worked under at that time said, Larry, we don't, we don't go at the pace you were used to, you go, we go at my pace. And that's foot to the floorboard that's how we, that's how we practiced. I, my last year in practice, my wife documented it. I made 23 calls a day. If I had a weekend off, it would be a three day weekend, actually a two and a half day weekend. And most of the time, my weekend would be a few hours on Sunday. And it, you know, just, it got to the point where, quite frankly, my wife said it's either me or the practice. And so, uh, so I got out of general practice and actually uh, had an interest in swine and went to manage a sow operation. The sow operation at that time, that was considered pretty good size. It was a 400 sow operation and it was intended to be managed with two people and I, in turn, managed it myself because my wife is a nurse and she could better be working as a nurse. She would come in occasionally to help me, but uh, I would take my children in with me and they would watch television while I <laughs> finished my chores. Uh, but I really enjoyed it. And since then, actually, I've managed uh, a number of sow operations I worked as a, as a swine consultant from um, three years in Illinois and 23 years in Pella, Iowa. And then I, I went back to managing for the most part. As I was managing the last sow operation, um, we had a lot of issues and that sow operation was antibiotic free. And I, I really strongly believe, because the European people have pretty well gone this way already, that that's the direction our industry will go, whether it's hogs, poultry, cattle, and it's going that direction faster and faster. I was approached by um, a contact that I had from years past uh, with this Bioreg product. I want to explain just briefly what, 
what the BioRig product is. It you just got some introductions into, okay. slides here. It's kind of inter yeah. You can just flip through those there if you want to. I'm going to go to, because this all fits Keep into going. Jim's protocols. Keep going. L let's stop there. Um, BioRig is basically an essential oils formula, and by the name, as, it, as the name implies, the primary essential oil is oregano. It is unique in that it's not only a formulation, but it's an encapsulation. By nature, essential oils, the term essential means that it has an essence. Any essential oil has an aroma to it, a, a dramatic aroma in some cases. A, oregano in its purest uh, oil form is very, very potent and even corrosive for that matter. What we've found is that it, by encapsulating, and the encapsulating ingredients are prebiotics, you actually in theory, the essential oils do have antibacterial properties, they have antiviral properties. So in theory, what we're doing is we're knocking down some in the digestive tract and we're increasing the microbes that are productive, that are enzyme producers. So in a cow, in a cow, you have a paunch which has, is loaded with microbes and the concern that the green people are concerned about methane production. Well, there's very good evidence, European evidence, that oregano helps lower the methane production from a cow. And in fact, we're going to be working, we're, we're going to be working to document that. We think that in fact is what part of why we get the response we do from oregano or from a bioreg. Um, I've had a lot of people approach me, or when I approach them about BioReg, in particular the organic people, when they find out there's oregano in it, they, they back off because they've, a lot of them tried oregano in, and overdosed and actually knocked out the good bugs as well as the bad bugs, just like, a, just like a, uh, an antibacterial will. We do not, thankfully, and so the, the things we see with BioReg, it doesn't matter the species, and I'll go through that a little bit, but what we, what we have found is that we almost always see an, a performance improvement. Uh, it varies with the species, uh, but we almost always see a, a performance improvement. We always see something in terms of intake. Uh, we actually market it as a feed flavoring agent into Canada because they they won't allow one of the ingredients that we uh, that are are in the original formula. That that intake may be that it's an increased intake intake, or it might in some cases be that the intake is instead of being up and down, it's it's more uniform, and that's very important with cattle. Um, cattle are, are notorious for an overload and what they'll do uh, on a cool or on a hot day, they back away from eating and they'll tank up at night. With, with oregano, we, we see a more uniform intake. Um, one of the things that we know that we affect is what we call gut health. The, by, by manipulating the mi microbes in the digestive tract, we're gonna see a change there. Um, we almost, we've documented in swine by university studies, and now we, we're in process of documenting that in all species. Uh, there's a, a reduction of what they call oxidative stress that's becoming a term that's more, no, more known actually in the human thing or in the human 
health uh, industry anymore, but oxidative stress has an effect on the animal as well in terms of uh, a reduction of inflammation and a reduction of actual stress like for, as for, for example from heat. Uh, the other thing that we see, the, the other ingredients that are in uh, the biorig have an impact on immune function. So I do, the other thing I do with microbes is I do farm specific vaccines made from a problem pathogen from a farm. And so I have found that using BioReg in some way, shape, or form and the vaccine, we get an, a, 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 a better response. What we've, uh, on, the, on cattle compared to a simple stomached animal, they're really much more inefficient as far as digestion is concerned. On poultry, you know, they're, poultry, they're close to, uh, they're under two to one in a lot of cases as far as feed to gain. Hogs are in that two and a half to one, the really good hogs now, but generally speaking, it's been three to one. Cattle on a dry matter basis, are closer to 10 to 1. The really good uh, cattlemen, they may be down to 7 to 1. We have some producers now that are down to 6 to 1. And that's a huge difference. And so, instead of, so instead of on hogs, we're seeing it maybe an improvement in feed efficiency of 5%. There's a greater opportunity on the ruminant, we see an improvement of 15% in some cases. So it's, we're, we're really excited about that. The, uh, when I started with the company, we started with one uh, feed product, and it was actually put together for us by one of the early uh, PhD doctors that was involved. It was put together in Minnesota he had had a bad experience with oregano in ruminants, so he would not even let us uh, market it to ruminants at that time, um, liability. And so we have just started on the ruminant side the, the last two years. Uh, so I've been working with the company six years. The original formula was used primarily in poultry and that's been for like 12 years. Uh, I was brought in on the swine side, but I also have experience on, on the ruminant side, on the dairy side. So um, yeah, we're really excited about what, what we can do on the ruminant side. You can go by that, we go by that one. Okay, I told you what the, the basic thing is in terms of what BioRig is. We started with one product. Since I've been involved, we now have uh, two other forms that are intended for primarily for ruminants. We have a, uh, the, the BioRig beef, so that's basically two and a half times more dilute so it can be used in a TMR. And we also have a product called Start Right, and that's intended for starting calves, and it's in a pelleted form. And again, it's even more dilute. It has some additional ingredients, in particular yucca. Um, and then we have two, uh, two forms that are really on a dextrose base instead of uh, instead of a, a, a soy base. And they're intended, one is intended, it's called MR, one's intended for milk replacers, and one is intended, uh, it has some additional essential oils and it's intended for use in water 
really we had, I developed it to, to cover those times when BioRig is probably already in the feed, but there's a, an extra stress or there's something extra going on, we can come in and actually bump up uh, the intake of BioRig. So we have it in the five forms now instead of uh, the original form, but um, we, we typically see uh, a, a performance improvement in about, about every species. So I have listed here the different, um, the different species as it, that it can be used in and the directions. So we're talking in terms of grams per 100 pounds per day or grams per head per day instead of pounds per head per day. It's very, very concentrated. Uh, on, on poultry, on broilers, we're, we're talking a pound per ton. Um, on finishing hogs, we're talking a pound per ton. It's just, uh, it, gives, it, it gives you a lot of bang for the, for the buck. It's, it's a very low inclusion uh, product. We, it, it really, in fact, it's such a low inclusion product for some people, they, they back off because you're talking grams. You know, so, you know, how, do you, how are you gonna get that into like a cow, for example? One gram of the original product for 250 pounds. We have found for the most part that that you can actually, I wouldn't say overdose, but if you, if you go beyond, beyond the suggested dosage, you improve digestion so much that there isn't as many solids in the stool, and we'll, get, we'll actually create a looseness in a little pig or a, or a little calf. And that gets people all concerned. It's just a temporary thing, but it's not an uncommon thing. Um, so yeah, we have for swine, for beef, for layers, for dairy, uh, you, you name it. Uh, I've actually used it in rabbits, guinea pigs, uh, you, you name it. As, we, uh, as far as the beef and dairy thing, the, the carrier there, we've actually just diluted it a little bit more, and the carrier is a distiller's byproduct. And that's if you're using a TMR. We use it in a TMR. The, right. the original one gram per 250 is you're putting it into, the, into your protein Usually, mix. Yes. Yeah. The original product, if it's to be used in a, in a beef operation, you almost have to uh, put it into their uh, grain mix uh, in order to get it, get it where it needs to be. We're, we're experiencing some really, uh, and I, I've got data uh, later on, we can go up, anybody interested, we can go over that. But uh, like I said, on, on beef cattle, we've seen as much as a 15% bump in, in rate of gain and feed efficiency. And that gets people's uh, attention. We had, we had one, uh, one trial where we actually improved the bottom line by 70 some dollars a head uh, and their cost was under seven. So that, that's a big, that's a big de deal. Uh, on the dairy side, um, the, big, the biggest factor we see on, and we see this in all the, about every species. We've seen this in pigs, goat, uh, yeah, goats, sheep, and dairy. We've actually documented an improvement in the colostrum. And so much so that on the swine side, we actually saw an improvement of the components the protein level in the colostrum by 20% on, and we see a similar thing, only we can measure it on dairy calves 
on uh, whether they've whether the cow ha in the her dry period has been on BioRake or not, we're looking at a 20% improvement in the protein level of the calf after, and that's, that's measured in a lot of the, the bigger dairies. Uh, we're seeing a, a typically a 20%, 18 to 20% bump in the protein. Well, what that amounts to is that calf is going to take off better. And uh, we're, we're looking at, we, we know people tell us that, for example, on pigs, that uh, pigs from the sows once they're on bioreg have a, a, a greater livability. They, they, they just have, a, have a more of a bounce to them. Part of that might be we've documented actually on swine, and this is university testing, uh, the sow farrows out 40% faster, so you have fewer stillborns, and of course, the sooner they're on the ground, and the, 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 the more uh, vi vitality those pigs have, the better they're going to take off. The PS concentrate is the water form, and I really had that in mind for pigs that are weaned. A lot of the, the pigs that I raise for, for uh, uh, this niche market, typically we creep feed them because we wean them at a later age. In the commercial business, I would say probably three-fourths of the pigs now at weaning have never seen solid feed. And so they're coming into these nurseries having maybe made a 2,000 mile trip and they're expecting them to eat and take off. And I don't care how much you've medicated to feed, they're gonna drink water, but may, they may not be drinking feed or eating feed. And so I wanted to get BioRig into them. If we were gonna put BioRig in the feed, on arrival, I want it in the water as well. And so that's why we developed the PS concentrate. It has two additional um, uh, essential oils in it that according to European literature have more of an effect on the gram positive uh, bacteria. Gram positives are streps, staphs, clostridiums. And so we're, we're covering we're doing a little more to, to manipulate those organisms, and we don't make claims, but it's kind of my mindset. Uh, just like what Jim was talking about on the manure side, you have different organisms that are responsible for different things. And the PS concentrate, a lot of those incoming pigs have strep issues, and so I wanted to address that. Uh, and, we, and we're finding uh, during COVID, uh, these pigs got dramatically cheap and we had a producer that we, and we were having a hard time even selling any, who wants to buy something that's going to improve something that you're going to lose money on anyway? Nobody wanted to, you know. And, but we thought, well, this is an opportunity to maybe do a trial so one of the fellows that helps uh, on the manufacturing side also has a couple of finishing barns and the guy that he feeds for bought, uh, they had his farrowing operation had broke with PERS and they, were, they just didn't have enough pigs anyway. He thought, well, I'm gonna buy some of these cheap pigs. So he bought some pigs. They came from Carolina. So it was a 2000 mile trip. They brought in uh, 1,800 in, on the first load and 1,500 on the second load, a, a week apart. The first load, we put BioRig in the water and in the feed. The second load, they managed them just like they would typically manage them. Uh, electrolytes in the water, antibiotic in the water, yada, yada, yada. And um, Harlan was told in a week's time, 
any pigs you don't like, just dispose of them because they're cheap enough. I think he paid $5 a pig for them. Basically, he paid for the trucking. And uh, after a week's time or two weeks, however long it was, Harlan had lost 30 pigs out of the 1,800. He had lost 300 pigs out of the other barn. And he had not lost any pigs to strep. The other barn, the majority of those 300 pigs were strep pigs. And so we, you know, Looked like to me, PS concentrate was, was doing some good. We've also used it on the poultry side, in particular on turkeys and broilers. Um, they're notorious for having a coccidia break, coccidia cyclical. They, they're notorious for having a coccidia break at uh, a week of, a weekend, something like that. And so we come in with the PS concentrate in the water, even, even though they're on the uh, bio rig in the feed, for a, about a five day window. And we've noticed that the people who really uh, are really into raising the broilers and turkeys, they know that day. They, they know when that's going to happen. And they've, they've no, what they've noticed is those pigs just keep, or those uh, broilers or turkeys just keep moving through. Uh, you talked about how fast they, I mean, they're talking on broilers, you know, it's uh, seven weeks of age, they're gone. They're uh, turkeys, they have, when they, from the day they get put in, they know the day they're going to go to market. And so the net, the net result is a heavier bird at, uh, we can help that out. The other, the other thing uh, we want to mention here yeah. is so what we've done is combined the UBO, what we call livestock drinking water plus TM, that's the trace mineral, that's your C crop. We formulate that 50-50. And so that, we're using that now in combination. We can use that with any of the poultry or the swine. Is what Actually we have, uh, and we, we've been looking for places where, where either Jim had the UBO in, in place that I'm coming in with yeah. a bio rig or vice versa, so we could document that tie. And we do have uh, an egg laying operation where we, uh, they, were, they had been on UBO even in the prior flock, I think, were they not? Right. And. Uh, yeah, we've been with, uh, with a group down in Iowa yep. with, uh, where the, worked with, for a, a fair, Field specialty yeah. out of Wisconsin, yeah. and they got a lot of lay. These are modern lay uh, layer barns, and they're they're niche market. They are antibiotic free, right. and they are what they call pastured. So we start in those barns with the UBO in the water, and they really love that. Well, then we introduce the bio rig to them, and then they're combining those. And the first the first barn that we were involved with, we used the PS concentrate because they they couldn't get it into their feed, and uh, that was about, probably about halfway into their, eight, yeah, half, halfway yep. into their uh, production. And what I found out later, after we'd been in there a while, from, the, uh, from Mark, is that his prior flock, even though he had UBO in place, he still had an E. coli break and lost a bunch of birds. So, at closeout of that first flock, instead of 20,000 birds, he had 19,000 birds. To close out when we had the two together, they were still laying at 85% and he still had 20,000 birds. Yeah. So. It totally turned that operation did, yeah. around. Yeah, so you're, look, you're looking at a, uh, I, I did some rough calculations and we talk about return on investment. I think I had calculated his to be seven to one on the right. use of the and then bio. they went and put the beef herd on it, the cows. Oh yes, and, and the he, calves. He now has the beef herd. So on. we've got about five leg uh, people in the in the leg egg laying business down there that have gradually got on the combination. But we're going to talk about milk replacer now, and we went into tagline dairy. We met. The, they've got a, a a lady that takes care of all their calves. And she's pretty darn sharp. 
and uh, very detailed. And so we met with her at the World Dairy Expo, mm -hmm. and I happened to, we happened to have the owner there and her there, and we got her on the MR with the calves. And man, she loves that. And then she's using the flax bedding and the bedding uh, barn tender combination. Well, now in the last month, we got her on the UBO because we don't want to hit them with both because you got to see the effect from one. Yeah. Yeah. And if it's positive, then we can go the next step. So they see it kind of build. And, and she said after a couple of weeks of the calves being on that, she says they're so energetic. <laughs> well, the so first, the first. Which means their gut. Yeah, it, their gut they, is feeling good. Right. Yeah. The first the first trial we ran on the MR, in fact, was in a Jersey dairy, and Jerseys are notorious for being difficult to start to work with, and uh, we've actually documented a thirty percent increase in gain in the time they were on the in on the milk replacer, and try the next slide. It might be I might have that in there. There it is. Yeah. Well, go, go to the next one. Oh, oh go back. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, what's really key on the calves, get this, a 30% increase in rate of gain and a 25% reduction in death loss. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. that. That was an eye opener. Yeah, that's an eye opener. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just because the gut health, controlling the pathogens, Stimulating the beneficials, and part of and part of and that better gut, digestion. Part of that gut gut health actually on uh, university studies we did on pigs, we, pigs that had been on it for uh, just through the nursery, we they actually did autopsies on the pigs, and they had control pigs. They had pigs that were on the typical antibiotic regimen, and they had pigs that were on Bioreg, and the, the Bioreg uh, pigs that we actually saw uh, an increase in the length of the villi and an increase in the spacing between the villi, and that's what has an, uh, it, there's more surface area for digestion, and that's why we get the, the better performance, as far as we're concerned anyway. We'll keep going here because it's about break time. Well, I'll, I'll kind oh, of help yeah. you out here, Larry. This, this, so, the, the go combination. Ahead. I think what I, yeah, we th we know that that UBO um, has a, increases the metabolism of the bacteria. So, my thinking, our thinking was that if if you've got more of the good bacteria in the gut, and then if you push them, yep, you'd get that much more of a response. Right. And so I we're think boosting the immune system which leads to better vitality and health, better increased water and feed intake, feed efficiency, better libido and breed back. This is big. I mean, if you can get these dairy cows to cycle better and uh, increased oxygen level in, in the, uh, for the animal in the water, uh, cleans out water lines. When we put this into the colonies in South Dakota, they'll say within a day, it cleans out all the biofilm. <laughs> and and uh, it you know it just helps overall. Uh, the manure coming out of the animal is more digested, completely digested. You're getting more nutrient out of that feed in the yep. animal. Yeah. So uh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so we we showed you this before, but the reason why I keep showing you this is to it's really stimulating the microbes. You're cascading the microbes, which are producing more of these wonderful enzymes and secondary metabolites. And, and so they're really, it's driving the microbial community. And uh, there's just kind of the simple label again. And then you have the dilution sheet. It's, it's certain part, like we'd like to start out at somewhere between 25 part per million dose rate. And you can get her down, once you get into it, maybe down around 15. A real difficult situation, we might start at 50 parts per million. So you're not talking about a lot of products. And again, uh, we've got sheets that show the benefit in each one of these animal units. Here's one, uh, Warren Crone was here yesterday from Nicollet. And you can see we put that into his uh, finishing barn and he saw basically uh, better days to turn, 
Uh, and again, average daily gain on feed was better and performance all the way through. This is, was done down in Brazil with, with uh, uh, actually a, a large a cargill. And look at those animals on the top. And, and then look at the animals on the bottom. After 45 days, you could see these on the top were more shiny and filled out. And uh, that one, uh, do we have it on the next slide? Yeah. That ended up being, um, the group resulted in an additional $142 uh, feed, uh, let's see, at $220 a pound. Yeah. The group resulted in an additional $442 uh, had minus a 2% increase in feed use. Yeah. So yeah. again, a pretty good re return on investment. So on we're, that. yeah, we're looking at the, the, th the thought being that the combination of the, because we see the similar uh, results on just BioRig, yeah. we're just excited to see what might happen yeah. when you put the two together. Okay. So, uh, we're going to get ready to take a break here then. And so over in this room over here, we have all the bio rig and the UBO laid out. And we have all the complete tech sheets for all of this if you want to go in there and talk to them about that. In that room there, we have the other livestock products. We have the HS35. Uh, Dennis will kind of be over in this area if you want to talk about crops. And uh, we have the nurse situation. Um, we have, um, Mark, would you come up just a minute? We have Mark Dodd here with the Pacific go. Grow, and uh, he operates uh, around the U.S. He's on the road a lot. Um, it, Mark is uh, actually doing a lot of things similar to what we're trying to do as a company in kind of helping producers in a holistic approach. Uh, and so we see the opportunity again, like with Larry, to kind of find uh, a common ground that we can work together. And so one of the things I'm trying to do with, with our company is grow with coalition partners. Like we're talking to hydro engineering up west of the cities that are manure haulers. We're, we're, we're talking to Stutzman's in Iowa. We're talking to the uh, Fairmont Vet. We're talking to Bronze up in Wisconsin. We feel by working together where we have common ground, we can, we can kind of scratch each other's back. And so, uh, working with Mark is kind of that kind of relationship. Uh, maybe just give us just a quick overview. And then, if you have questions during the break, you can go one-on-one -on -one with them. But why would a producer consider using your products over other maybe fish products that are out there today? What, what's the advantage of what you have? Okay. Uh Thank you very much, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here and meet everybody. Um, so Pacific Grow is a unique product because it's made out of salmon, crab, shrimp, and shell off the coast of, of Washington. So what the uniqueness of that is, and we got some proprietary uh, uh, methods that we use to, to make our product, is that it's fungi dominant food source. It really stimulates the beneficial microbes of the soil and kind of leaves that, that bacteria that's, that may be uh, um, trying, to, trying to cause uh, some problems in the soil and, and tie up nutrients. Um, it kind of leaves that alone. So it's fungi dominant, so it's going to increase this fungi of the soil and reduce the bacteria that's in your so soil. So Mark, the question time. we often have is what, what would be the ideal fungal bacteria ratio that we'd w want to strive in the Midwest and what in industrial ag do we presently have today? Well, you're bacteria dominant, meaning you're over 50%. Uh, we want to, to upset that and make that higher. I don't know what the exact numbers are that, that you want, but you still want more fungi than you want bacteria. That's just a simple part of it. Now, there's certainly a lot of things that we still don't know about bacterial um, or the, uh, the microbes, uh, and, we're, and we're, we're, we're getting there. But uh, what the attraction is to working with Jim is, he thinks a systems approach. I think a systems approach. When I started with Pacific Grow um, four or five years ago, uh, I brought that system in, um, and it's all about the soil. And in that soil, we have microbes. We need to introduce certain microbes to do 
specific things and we need to uh, feed those microbial communities. And since we're all from livestock, I said it's as simple as having a, a pen of, pen of uh, steers out there. You're, you've got to feed those steers and spoon feed those steers certain amounts of, uh, uh, of, of the ration uh, as their growing cycle increases. I was just at a producer's farm yesterday and he's, he's going to get plus 300 bushel corn in Nebraska off of 100 pounds of nitrogen. How can that happen? Well, it's a microbial world that we're, we're looking at. And you've got a, it's a complex system. And I'm here to, to have a system approach like Jim, and that's my attraction to Jim. So when we, we use, in layman's term, the commercial fishermen off the coast of Washington, drops their nets, they bring in salmon, crab, shrimp, and shell. Sometimes we'll get some white fish, sometimes, whatever's going on up there. And um, lobsters. And we'll take, they'll take that on the boat and they'll take all the meat off and they'll give us all the blood and guts and the glory and the fats and everything that goes with it. And that's the good stuff. It's not a pretty place to go visit. And we won't let you visit. <laughs> but it's like going to a slaughterhouse and... and um, so, and we got some different things that we do with it. Uh, we put some different biologicals in there to break down some bone structure so you get more soluble forms of calcium. Uh, you got higher phosphorus when you start using those, that, uh, those skeletons, those racks from other fish. There's rack brokers, you know, uh, bone brokers up that way. You know, it's a whole, whole different culture up there. And, um, you know, when you're talking about corn, soybeans, or, or any kind of vegetable crops, you're talking about spoon feeding. So when you're talking corn, soybeans, or even wheat, uh, we want to front load that, you know, with like a, like a pre-treatment. I mean, that's the kind of the Cadillac version. Uh, so before planting, during planting by, with a starter, and then spoon feed it throughout the year. So if you're still using nitrogen, you can back down your 28% or 32% your liquids, um, probably 40% at least first year, and then add to four gallon each application. And you'll need about, you know, 10 gallon. If you're wanting to get these high yields, you need at least 10 gallon of Pacific Grow. Uh, and some other microbes. That, that over the season? Over the season. So, so do, how would you use those 10 gallons then in, in raising corn? Um, you can spray it with a burn down. I don't suggest it, but I got a guy that's doing it. Because uh, I don't want do to... We, we want to start in the fall. If we, we can't, we'd like to start in the fall. With the crop residue right. digestion program with that in there. Right, and then come back in and either do a pre... Uh, a pre-plant or a starter or a starter uh, I got a guy that's using it as burned down with his glyphosate and he says it's great it's not a problem but I don't like that claim it just seems to me you got some chemical that's trying to kill everything with something that's trying to promote everything and make everything grow that's antagonistic for sure um, starters great you never want to mix it with a phosphorus form of uh, synthetic phosphorus because the soluble form of calcium that is in the Pacific Row will gel up and precipitate and it'll plug your planter and we'll never be friends again. Um, so we got to make this as, as easy as possible. Uh, and then through the year, if you're doing any foliar treatments, it's great just stick it into foliar treatments. My guys in, uh, in Iowa had problems with earworm or army worm, and uh, they put one gallon of Pacific Grow, one gallon of Sea Crop, one gallon of Metagrow, or a half a gallon of Sea Crop and a half a gallon of Metagrow ST, and it took out the earworms, but it also gave it that nutritional punch. And and that's when you're starting to work with these biologic, like Jim. Metagrow is, is a biologic. Right. Yeah. So we, when you're looking at these biologicals like Jim's got, you're not only suppressing one thing you're also giving it that nutritional yeah. punch that it needs so we come in with specific grow now when you're doing um the the two formulations you have the high phosphorus where do you use that one then versus I, the low phosphorus i love using the high phosphorus in your starter program okay and um 
I don't see any phosphorus deficiencies out here. The, the, it comes up, it comes up faster. It comes up more even. I think we're also. This is just my opinion. I think seed treatments. We need a biological seed treatment. We don't need to be paying for seed treatments that you get with your commercial uh, varieties just because I know that it's antagonistic and it'll hurt your biology. We're not, you seem like you can't get anything that's not treated anymore through some of your big companies, but uh, we'll work around that. And then come with the other formulation, we would use that in our fall digestion program or spring digestion program and then into our foliar program. Yeah, I'm really excited about, about these uh, fall applications because anytime you're breaking down this debris to be plant available, you're just setting the stage for a lot of good things for the next growing season. Well, the thing that the fall does versus spring, spring is okay, but fall gives you that all winter for that. And even though it's cold out there and there's snow, those microbes are working underneath there, just like in a manure pit. And, you know, get that done in the fall if you can, you know, put it as a priority. Yeah, and I know we're, the cover crop story, I love the cover crop story. It's a great management <laughs> tool, but Sometimes it don't fit in everybody's system, and uh, they get late planting after harvest and things like that. I mean, it's a great thing to have, but I just feel like what we're doing is kind of a liquid cover crop right. program on steroids. That's, that's a very good point, and we need to make that more often, is by doing the fall program with the UBO and bioregenerate and the fish and, and you, you know, options, that is kind of a quick cover crop approach, which gives you a lot of the same benefits as a cover crop. We, we're not saying don't use cover crops, but it takes management. And not everybody's got the time or the willingness to do that. So this is really a, a good alternative. And I don't like to beat up on other people's products, but when you're looking at something that's cheap, um, it's made out of carp. What are carps? They're bottom feeders of, in our rivers. What's in the rivers? Nitrates, glyphosate, other kinds of carcinogenics. And, and we're going to put that back on the soil. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think we're going anywhere when we do that. A lot of the, and we went head to head with other what they call fish. Uh, but we're seafood. We've got different crustaceans going on in there. We have the chitin story that's that's in there, and Jim will tell you more about chitin, I'm sure. But uh, chitosan is just a great uh, a great enzyme that's, that's proven itself to be very beneficial. Uh, kind of my my feel good story on strawberries in California is they use chlorpictrin. I don't know what they use now. I think chlorpictrin may be a, may be a, not labeled anymore, but they use that to kill all the nematodes. So they set all the biology back twice a year doing strawberries because it's a six month crop out there. So they use Pacific Row and some other microbes to get that kick started again. We took the guy's um, um, yields from 24 to 48 ton per acre in six months. Um, that's year one, and then year, year two, we took them into the almost 60, 60 ton. Wow. This is unreal uh, amount of, of yields and better quality. When you're looking at corn soybeans, I think something that, that we don't talk about, but it needs to be um, developed is premiums for better quality corn, better quality yeah. Uh, soybeans and mm -hmm. I'm trying to start you know kind of that discussion and maybe a, a business in the future about that where that we can prove to a dairy that we can get better quality of milk um, breed backs are better uh, cows are more calmer they milk better more yield you know same way with poultry yep. uh, and, and uh, swine so it's a wonderful opportunity and and agriculture is changing it's just it's, we become very lethargic and lazy over the years, I think. Yep. And, uh, and I'm from Indiana and I farm. Um, and family disruption in, in the state took me to Russia, so I was, I was managing a million and a half acres for Mr. Putin over there. So that's where my love for biological farming really started because you can get 8% organic matter 
and you can make it come alive if you found some humic acid or some poultry litter. I was taking all our poultry litter and, and uh, pelleting it. But, you know, because it's socialism, um, they got to get a prime minister of agriculture that owns the fertilizer cartel over there, and he gets me tossed out of Russia because I wasn't buying enough fertilizer. <laughs> But now, I, I will say, anybody that's worked with fish, which we have for years, a lot of it has an unpleasant odor to it, and it's very difficult to work with, and if you leave it around too long, it kind of goes out of condition. Go over and pull the cap off of one of their products and smell it. It's got a pleasant odor to it, it's stable, it's just a delight to work with, and I, I think that's, that's very, very positive. It, it's not a pungent smell, like yeah. somebody needs to take the trash out. It's not a pleasant smell, like you don't want to put it behind your ears and go, and go take your wife out to eat. But it's not bad. It's better than smelling, smelling uh, mouth ion or, or glyphosate, you know, yeah. so. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. And uh, again, if you have questions, uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's take a, let's take a you know twenty minute half an hour break.